Mark, having a look at just some of the findings of the report, it, it looks pretty dire, just the percentage of firms that feel that they've been negatively affected, the percentage of firms that are considering, you know, moving staff or potentially relocating headquarters. How crucial is this juncture in terms of decisions like that being made? Well, good morning, Heidi. Thank you for having me on today. And um, it is crucial, but maybe before I, I talk about that, I mean, I think we should first commend Hong Kong for the zero COVID policy that they've uh, maintained for so long. I mean, it's been able to keep the territory safe uh, and COVID cases pretty much very, to, to nil. Uh, and we've been able to live kind of a normal life within this bubble. And so you could argue um, uh, that Hong Kong in the first part of the pandemic has won the day. Uh, the challenge really now is today is that uh, there are major competitors, or major financial centers uh, like New York, like London, Frankfurt, Paris, and now including within this region, Singapore, Tokyo, uh, Sydney, and they're all moving to living with COVID. Uh, and Hong Kong is still maintaining this zero COVID policy. And that's problematic because Hong Kong's ISC, the financial center here, is worth 20%, just north of 20% of the GDP of this territory. And that's the direct amount. If you add in the indirect expenditure on luxury goods, housing, restaurants, it's even far greater. Um, so the challenge that we're having right now is we need to protect that and enhance that. Um, and, and because of the tight quarantine requirements around this, uh, uh, you know, we're finding that firms are having a huge problem. And every firm that we surveyed pretty much has said, we're having problems retaining talent. They want to go home. They want to move elsewhere where they can actually have live a more normal life um, and and they're also having when those people leave having real problems attracting people in to fill those empty positions so firms even if they are really committed to hong kong and china uh, are in the situation where 50 percent of them 50 percent as half of firms are contemplating that they need to move positions uh, out of hong kong and that's really significant um, so what we really want to see from Hong Kong is we've seen them say, you know, China's a priority and opening up to China's priority, priority, and that's where a lot of the firm's clients are. However, we need some sort of a roadmap to give people, the individuals that work for these companies, some sort of comfort and certainty that they're going to be able to move on to a normal life uh, within the, 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 the foreseeable future, uh, as they are seeing in other IFCs. Otherwise, right. even if firms maintain this, they're going to lose these mm -hmm. people. And Mark, I should point out, as we're speaking to you, you yourself are in quarantine after <laughs> having just returned to Hong Kong. The problem yeah. is that the roadmap to living with COVID, um, for example, here in Australia, here in Sydney, vaccination, getting vaccination rates really high is such a key part of that. That's not even something that the corporate sector can do in Hong Kong because the, the lag is over 60s. That's correct. And I think getting the vaccination rates up is hugely important. I mean, I just came back, you mentioned, from Canada, uh, seeing my parents. And, you know, what you see there and, uh, is the, you know, the government saying that if you want to be employed, you need to be vaccinated. And you're seeing the private sector following that. You're seeing vaccine passports coming in that if you want to go out to uh, a restaurant, you need to be vaccinated. If you want to do anything in the community, you need to be vaccinated. So there needs to be tools that actually get those vaccination rates up. Uh, that the government can use, which which ultimately will allow for the opening up. Um, and as you say, the most vulnerable people are uh, are the ones that aren't getting vaccinated. I mean, you know, I, again, like I was just in Canada, and you know, to get into a home, uh, you need to be vaccinated uh, to see your to see your folks. You know, the people in the homes need to be vaccinated. They don't have a choice if they want to be there. So there are things the government can do to get those vaccination rates up much faster. Uh, so that we can open up uh, and maintain, as I say, that IFC. And uh, I think, you know, what we really want to see from Hong Kong is they won probably the first part of COVID. Can they win the second part of COVID by catching up uh, and ultimately opening up and protecting mm -hmm. the IFC? IFC is the future of Hong Kong. Right. Without the financial center, you know, uh, Hong Kong uh, ec economically is going to suffer. And it's in China's inter interest okay. to protect that as well. Well, do you, do you feel like the, um, the the global banks and the big asset managers have have gotten more stirred up about this? That it's become a, a much bigger concern. They didn't seem so vocal previously. Well, I think it comes back to the point I made earlier, right? Is that that uh, even if they're committed to Hong Kong and they're committed to China, which they all are, and that's why they're here, uh, the individuals are looking across the border and they're seeing back home that things are going back to normal. They're seeing the competing, competing financial centers opening up. Uh, so they don't want to be stuck here in this bubble. Uh, 
uh, and they don't want to have to do quarantine when they come back to the to the standards that, that we're, we're seeing. So they're being forced by their employees to actually take this mm -hmm. seriously because they're, they're, they're seeing a huge amount of people leaving and they can't replace them. Uh, that's why the employment market in Hong Kong is so buoyant, because the only way of actually replacing people is effectively poaching them from your competitors, which is also increasing the cost of, of your um, of, of staff, which is pretty much the dominant um, cost for, for banks uh, in financial right. markets. Well, um, Mark, Carrie Lam is accountable to the Chinese government, not to big global institutions. So you know, how uh, confident are you that they might actually consider ending the COVID uh, COVID zero strategy with a clear exit strategy, maybe even more testing and offices, that kind of thing, the way uh, many uh, place, many companies in, in New York have done? Um, or do you think that they're just going to put their foot down? Yeah, well, I think at the, at the moment it seems like they're putting their foot down. But I think, you know, one of the reasons why we want to have this engagement and we want to be constructive is we all want the same thing. I think Carrie Lam, is, she's made it very clear, she wants to maintain and protect the IFC. She recognizes the benefits uh, to Hong Kong. We recognize that Hong Kong basically has to have a discussion and agree what they do with China. And that, that makes perfect sense. You know, Hong Kong is, a, is an inalienable part of, of, of China. However, you know, both Hong Kong and China need to understand that the current policies put the IFC under threat. Um, and that's not really in Hong Kong's interest, but it's no longer, it's not in, in China's interest either. You know, China wants to, you know, Hong Kong is China's only IFC. Um, and if that if that changes into just a Chinese financial center, some sort of offshore uh, center, not in a national yeah. financial center, that's not in China's interest either. Um, so there, in those discussions, you know, our view is, you know, we, we think there are people within the government that very well understand this, is to advocate for a stronger opening for uh, for Hong Kong and a clear roadmap to do it. Um, and then and then they could do some even small things initially, like, you know, the look back policy. I mean, for example, if I tested positive when I came in uh, from Canada the other day, uh, they would look back 21 days. I was only in Canada for 14 days. So my family could be sent to Penny Bay. Anybody in close contact to me sent to Penny Bay, even though the chances of me of picking up COVID in Hong Kong would have been mm -hmm. pretty much nil. Um, and, and, you know, those policies can change. They can make tweaks right. around uh, around the sides. These things are even tougher than you see in China. So there's no reason why they have to be so tough compared to, you know, what we're all okay. we're seeing on the main.